that the universe is not at all what we suppose it to be, and that we are in effect presented with a three-dimensional, four-dimensional, eleven-dimensional koan, a labyrinth, a puzzle, a kind of conundrum which has to be cut through. And it's all done in the mind. The whole uh, apparent world is actually uh, syntactical in nature. This is what they don't tell you uh, in the philosophy departments or the, or the physics departments, that the universe is made of words and that there has to be a speaker and there has to be a hearer. Photons, quarks, anti mumate that's not what it's about. That is a linguistic model that floats above the bedrock of syntactical connectedness that mind travels through to create networks that it interprets meaningfully. That's what's really going on. So, and I am not one to reach for, you know, the metaphors of spirit with the connotation of moral opprobrium and all that, but there is a, a dimension which is accessible to each and every one of us. This is the primary thing about it. It's accessible that is so appallingly, titanically, and bizarrely different than the continuum that we're currently residing in that it seems to throw doubt on the entire effort to understand the world as it's been carried out over the past 1,500 years. In other words, there is an object in this mental space which as culture-creating creatures we are attempting to colonize and invade this cultural space through the concrescence of language, in other words, through exteriorizing our ideas as tools, we are invading this cultural domain, this alternative reality, and the exploration by drugs, with psychedelic drugs, and then the, the pervasive problem with other sorts of drugs in the society. It's, it's, and it cuts very close to the core of ourselves as creatures. I mean, we are addictive animals. We addict to everything. We addict to each other and glorify it as our most noble outpouring of sentiment in the phenomenon of romantic love. I mean, when, when a pair of lovers are parted, the withdrawal symptoms are indistinguishable from heroin. I mean, vomiting, shaking, uncontrollable emotional outbursts, sleeplessness, short temper, hysteria. This is real. It is a fem what romantic love is, is a pheromonal bonding, an exchange of chemical messengers which takes these two autonomous organisms and welds them into one galaxy of need and intention and understanding and expectation. Well, then you just tear that apart and people are, you know, shook up. We addict to political ideals, you know, all kinds. I mean, it's wonderful what's happening in Peking, but uh, several decades ago, the same thing was happening in Berlin to a different beat. You know, people find an idea, and it works, and all barriers appear to be movable, and all goals attainable. We addict to things. This is, a, you know, like magpies but then through media trained to propel ourselves into ever more extensive relationships with objects. We invent money, which is kind of a uh, uh, multi-transformable drug. It stands for everything, you know, everything you ever wanted, and you can addict to money. Nevertheless, uh, what I will argue during this month is that, uh, that this is not a bad thing. 
that we have a secret history that I will try to convince you of, and, I, and you should try to convince me that I'm wrong, and we will argue over the secret history of the human race and why it is, therefore, that we are as we are, and why it is that these psychedelics are not some peripheral issue of screwballs who can see God in a cabbage, but that, in fact, the issue of psychedelics is directly on the tracks of the onrushing locomotive of rationalist, paternalist, uh, schlockola society, and that it ain't going to go away, because what we're talking about here is a nude part of the human mind. What we're talking about here is something which takes its place in the great unfolding of the, defin of the defining of human freedom that characterizes the entire adventure of global civilization. In other words, uh, you know, we've got the Pope under control. That happened in the Middle Ages. Uh, slavery has now been generally embraced as a bad thing to be into. And we've gotten that on the books as a bad idea. <laughs> Women have been suddenly recognized to be human beings, and so forth. So this, this swelling bubble of aha and perception of the real nature of the universe should also include the uh, sudden realization that governments have no business telling people what foods and spices they should prefer, that this is an absurd role for government, and that like slavery, like the uh, subjugation of women, the uh, uh, legal uh, persecution of dietary habits has just got to take its place with the high-button shoe. Uh, and we will talk a lot about the consequences of this. What does it mean? Because you see, what the government would have us believe, and perhaps believes itself, although I doubt it, is that we would return to the beast. That's all. You know, we would just shoot junk and toot blow and flop around uh, in ruinous orgies until hell froze over. And they, wiser sterner, more disciplined than ourselves, represent the edifice of moral authority. This is a, I'm doing it for your own good trip, see. Um, but I want to return for a minute to the transcendental object, because that's the part which gets me off the most. It's taken me a long time to believe what was actually happening, in that... I always said uh, I could believe it if I read it in the newspaper, but I can't believe it because it's happening to me, or it's happening so near to me. But I just, you know, it hardly now seems to matter. And what we just have to do is to try and talk frankly based on our, the experience which each of us brings to this, about, you know, the thing. How much of it have you seen? Well, what do you think? You know, how, how does it cast its shadow into your life? What is it? Uh, because I talk on these subjects, I am a sort of a nexus point for information, and I gather stories, and I see that, you know, science and rational philosophy and all that stuff is going on over here quite to its heart's content while hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands and thousands of people exactly like ourselves are logging in these experiences which are, you know, absolutely off the scale. And I, I just don't, I mean... You know, there are a lot of people having problems. People abducted by UFOs, people visited by Whitley Strieber's Triangle Face. That's not where I'm coming from. I mean, 
I have nothing but scorn for all weird ideas other than my own. <laughs> so, and, and the reason I tolerate my own weird ideas is basically because of what I've gone through. I would never believe it if I hadn't seen it. You know, there's a wonderful story, and I'm, I have no love for Christianity either, but I'll tell a, a Christian story. This is what I got out of the Gospels. Uh, Christ appeared several times in the upper room after the crucifixion to the apostles. The first time he appeared, the apostle Thomas was not there. And so um, then uh, Thomas came after the visitation and uh, they said uh, the master was here he was with us and Thomas said oh, <laughs> <laughs> and they said no no he was here and he said unless I put my hand into the wound I will not believe it so time passed and Christ came again to the upper room. And uh, Thomas was there among the other apostles. And Christ said, uh, Thomas, come forward. Put your hand into the wound. And he did. And he did. Now, the conclusion that I draw from this story is alone of all human beings in human history Thomas the doubter touched the incorporeal resurrected body of Christ only the doubter was allowed that privilege for everybody else you know the show and I I just take that absolutely seriously I think that God or he she or it loves the doubter and pr prepares treasures in paradise for the doubter that eclipse anything. And th it, the method has worked for me. And I have seen absolutely astonishing things. I'm sure many of you have too. I have seen things where I had perfect confidence that no human being had ever laid eyes on these places before. And I'm sure you have too. Because that's how big it is in there. It is, the further in you go, the bigger it gets. We are like monkeys sitting in the presence of a flying saucer whose doorway has just been flung open. This is what we need to become conscious of. We need to dissolve the assumptions of the culture. And this is why LSD was so terrifying, because I firmly believe that one of the things psychedelics do is they uh, dissolve cultural assumptions. It doesn't matter whether you're a member of the Politburo or a go-go dancer in Berlin or a professor of agronomy in Kansas. You will doubt your beliefs and your world if you take psychedelics. This is good. We need to dissolve our cultural conditioning and try to get down to brass tacks because I'm convinced that reality is a tinker toy set that we can learn to take apart and put together in completely different ways. And we're going to have to pull some real rabbits out of the hat, or the planet is just going to pour over the edge into chaos. Uh, and I, you know, before they were called psychedelics, they were called consciousness-expanding drugs. Well, if there's any possibility that that's true, Let's put our best people on it because consciousness is what we're dying for. We don't have enough of it. We can't feed the hungry. We can't manage a global economy. We can't hold down guerrilla warfare. We can't cure AIDS. We need to get smart. And if this stuff has anything to do with getting smart on any level, even for one in a thousand of those who use it, 
core it on. We can't stand around like a bunch of nitwits just watching the planet burn down around us. Now, it's very touchy, this whole thing, because it is literally and, uh, and perhaps metaphorically as well illegal, forbidden territory. We're like South Pacific Islanders. We have taboos, you know? Bring this plant into your house and you must go away to the big slammer for a while. <laughs> this is a taboo. Um, I don't... I'm, my position, which I don't suppose I should say I advocate it, because as I understand it, that's one higher level of federal crime. So here is my position, but I don't advocate it. <laughs> <laughs> is that, uh, you know, people should be able to do whatever they damn well please, uh, that government is for the convenience of people. And in particular, in the United States, we already have in place a clause which says life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are inalienable rights. Inalienable. That means government cannot interfere with these rights. Well, pursuit of happiness, I don't think you have to be a shyster to believe that pursuit of happiness covers experimenting with psychedelic substances. Seems to me perfectly clear. I think that, uh, you know, part of what I do as I speak around, and I suppose I should say it here because I imagine some of you will end up psychotherapists or are psychotherapists, is that, uh, you know, without an understanding and a familiarity of the psychedelic experience, uh, you should be sued for fraud if you're practicing psychotherapy. <laughs> because... Uh, the dynamics of the mind, isn't that what psychotherapy is about? Well, you know this much unless you have had a variety of psychedelic experiences. That's where the confirmation of all this theory is, and that's where you find out what you're running from. It isn't that it is a psychotomimetic, as the, the government researchers hoped it would turn out to be. It's simply that it plays all the changes. You know, it pulls out the stops and it plays in the major and the minor keys and you uh, see it all. This is indispensable for psychotherapy. And if you look at the, the cure statistics on alcoholism with LSD, uh, it's phenomenal before LSD was made illegal. Now, I understand, I, do, I don't believe these are chemical cures to drug dependency. That isn't how it works. It works like this. You take LSD, you're an alcoholic or a junkie. You take LSD, all your illusions and defenses are dissolved. You see that you're killing yourself and that you're a pathetic wretch and that you're destroying yourself and the people around you. And then you come down. And out of that experience, you existentially draw, in some cases, the power the self-will and the motivation to change your behavior. Well, I believe that as a culture, we could do this. And this comes perilously close to sounding like everyone should take LSD. I don't believe that. I think that uh, it's, a, it's a calling. It's a kind of a profession. It's, uh, well, shamanism is the best model. And I think that the, the rebirth of shamanic uh, awareness is part of a much larger cultural phenomenon which I call the archaic revival. I hate the term New Age. I think it's just, uh, you know, 11 o'clock news stuff. But the archaic revival is a notion of a series of integrated trends that have been going on for over a hundred years that are the actual turning belly up of Victorian Christian scientific male-dominated uh, civiliz materialist civilization. It begins with 
phenomena like pataphysics in the 1880s in France and surrealism and Freud and Jung and abstract expressionism and even the Nazis had a piece of the action because of their understanding of how ritual and propaganda and I mean Goebbels was the the architect of the German archaic revival and LSD has a part of it and what it is is it's uh, an intuition an intuition that to save ourselves from what we have done we must reach far far back in time for a stabilizing metaphor not as the Renaissance did back to classical Greece and Rome to create classicism which of course all happened in the 15th century but further back to uh, prehistory to a time when people and nature lived in a kind of balance. I don't mean just any time in prehistory. I mean essentially the post-glacial period called the Magdalenian, about 19,000 years ago, when the glaciers began to melt and the Sahara turned green again and uh, the cave paintings were done at Lascaux and Altamira. Bone antler technology was invented. It was the great springtime of our people and the last springtime of our people and then we came down through uh, but in that time in a partnership society and this is Rian Eisler's term and I will talk about that through the month in a partnership society there was no oscillation between a matriarchy and a patriarchy there are dominator societies and there are partnership societies. And gender has nothing to do with it. We can entirely overcome the bullshit about gender in talking about cultural forms. It's dominator versus partnership. And uh, the partnership society that existed in those times was the quintessential expression of a symbiotic relationship. And this is a new, you know, new idea that I want to get across during this month, which is our anxiety, our angst, our wandering in the wasteland is because um, there's something wrong with us that we, didn't, that we don't know about. What it is is this. We are symbiotic creatures. We require a relationship with a certain plant and if we don't have this we go slightly bananas and this symbiotic relationship was disturbed about 12,000 years ago it has to do and I will go over it in more detail downstream but it has to do with uh, periods of, of drought in the African continent that forced people into the Middle East and to where they were no longer able to access this plant, then begins what we call human history at the, at, at the 11,000 BP point at uh, places like Jericho and Chatal Hyuk in southern Anatolia. What's happening with human history is a, 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 a perhaps not even articulated, but nevertheless restless driving search for substitutes substitutes for the lost partnership ambiance, substitutes for the plant symbiote which held that in stasis. And these substitutes work their way over the millennia through uh, the opium cults of Anatolia, um, the hemp cults of the Scythians, the Eleusinian mysteries. And the, these are the great uh, acceptable substitutes for the mystery. You see, what religion is, is a contact with the tremendum, with the numinosum at the beginning of history in this context of plant hallucinogenesis. And then the fall, the fall, literally the fall, is the telescoping stages that moved us away from the original purity of this numinous image. And it ends in crack addiction. It's all about substances. This is why we frantically search the universe for 
what my friend Leo Zeff used to call the perfect high. That's what we're looking for. We can't help ourselves. Whole cultures are doing it. And they don't think of it as a drug. They think of it as an epiphany, a religious system, a, a set of sacramental buildings or a, a city organized on a divine plan. But what they're trying to do is restore order. And they can't do it because like the romantic lovers parted, the partner is not present. The, the uh, completing anima image is simply not there. And so we are restless, violent, neurotic, repressive, migratory, uh, destructive, self-negating, so forth and so on. I think that we're coming to the place where we can actually begin to take an idea, like what I just said, and amass evidence for and against it, and try to then cure ourselves. In a way, I'm, I'm trying to carry out a kind of Jungian analysis where we realize that we are all the children of some kind of very damaging thing which happened in prehistory. And it's plain as the nose on your face. It's just that we are so traumatized we do not see it. I mean, look at... The, the story of Eden, which is the central datum, the central mythologium of our culture. It's a story of uh, substance abuse and the consequent punishment that follows upon that because Eve <laughs> eats of the fruit of the tree of life. And it says in Genesis, if they eat of this fruit, they will be as we are. In other words, it was specifically the issue of consciousness expansion and Yahweh, the jealous God, the volcano God of a paternal, of a, uh, of a dominator culture, and said, no, you're not coming into that inner sanctum. But she had eaten of it anyway. So there was a parting of the ways. Well, this parting of the ways... I believe, is a metaphorical description of the breakup of this symbiosis in Africa and the fall into profane time, the, the uh, withdrawal of the, uh, the bride, really, I mean, in, in alchemical terms or in terms of the, of the union marriage of the anima and the animus. And... Uh, we are now, I think, in a position to uh, at least talk about this as a possibility because this thing which was driving these religions on the plains of Africa was uh, a tryptamine hallucinogen. It was specifically a mushroom which was occurring in the, uh, the dung of the, most, of the early cattle that were just at that stage being domesticated. Well, the experience which that mushroom induces in us is no less overwhelming and transcendental and incomprehensible than it was to those people 15,000 years ago. We have nothing up on them. In fact, we may be in a worse position to understand it because our language is now carrying a thousand, a millennia long legacy of paternalistic, egocentric, uh, materialistic and empirical biases. They may have possessed languages that far better commanded the true modalities of the transcendental object than do our languages. So the archaic revival is uh, an invitation to historical humanity to view itself as a kind of prodigal son and to abandon the, the wandering in history, the peregrination in history, and to return to the archaic fold with what has been learned. And what I will suggest to you that has been learned is uh, the purification and, uh, and uh, rational analysis 
of the uh, sine qua non of the whole shtick, which is the hallucinogenic compounds. In other words, human history is a dipping into matter, a kind of Faustian um, pact to come away with what the shamans of the of archaic times were approaching by a natural means. I I'm fascinated by the mystery of language because it's very central to understanding what psychedelics are. Why do I say that? Because, and I will refer again and again to DMT, dimethyltryptamine, as the most interesting for many reasons of these psychedelics. But today I just want to mention one aspect of it. In the trance that overwhelms you when you uh, experience this hallucinogen, it only lasts for a few hundred seconds. And in that place, there are entities that are making sounds which visibly condense before you. In other words, language has the potential, I swear to you, in other words, this settles a question, language has the potential to be seen rather than be held. Well, I saw this years ago in DMT flashes, and lo and behold, a thorough inspection of Philo Judaeus, who lived contemporary with Jesus Christ and was an Alexandrian Jew who wrote a, volumes of commentary on the religions of his era. Philo Judaeus talks about what he calls the Logos. The Logos was an interiorized teaching voice which a Greek ecstatics sought to contact. And Philo says, he, asks, he, he sets up a little dialogue, and the first speaker says, what would be a more perfect logos, a more perfect logos than the, the informing teaching voice? And Philo answers, the more perfect logos would go from being heard to being beheld without ever crossing over a noticeable moment of transition. Astonishing. I mean, I always wonder, do these people, did they know what they were talking about? <laughs> what did it mean to them? What did it mean to him to write that sentence? Well, we'll never know, so here's what it means to me. <laughs> 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 it means that the program of language is an open-ended one and that we are dynamically caught up in it, that we are language. That's what distinguishes us from the, those who chirp and twitter and romp in the trees, that we are language and that language is evolving. It's changing and that, in fact, what we call culture is nothing more than a kind of shock wave trailing behind the, the forward edge of this language-making capacity because you can't invent it before you can say it, you can't sell it before you can describe it, you can't do anything with it until it exists as a, lingu as a, a commandable set of syntactical connections. So in one sense, and, what, and I will carry this forward over the month, what the psychedelics are for us as a species, rather than for each one of us as an individual, what they are for us as a species is an enzyme that catalyzes the language-making capacity. What is an enzyme? An enzyme is an organic catalyst. What is a catalyst? A catalyst is a chemical agent which causes a chemical reaction to proceed faster than it ordinarily would without being consumed. The, the catalyst is not consumed. So I, I think that the astonishing proliferation of cultural effects, languages, religions, ontologies over the past 40,000 years out of nothing, because before that human organization was, I mean, it was dull, 
back there for a million or two years. I mean, it was there was, so far as we can tell, no material culture at all. Now, you may wish to defend that it was wonderful, but you will find you have no evidence for it. But suddenly, after staying stable for a million years, the human brain size doubles almost overnight, and there is this cascade of cultural effects. I maintain that it has to do with pastoralism as a behavioral habit, bringing these proto-hominids into contact with psilocybin as a dietary element, and that psilocybin specifically catalyzed certain qualities of the human organism that worked to its evolutionary advantage, such as consciousness. Can you imagine a more multipurpose, mutational, adaptational change that would serve you well than being able to think clearly? I mean, if a, if a flatworm could think clearly, evolutionary horizons would open before it, or any other organism. It's like a super non-specific immune response. You can handle any problem. Give me a problem. I'm a thinker. I can handle it. You know. So, uh, the catalysis of language. Well, then, it only ceased uh, 2,000 years ago at Eleusis, when triumphant Christers stomped out paganism wherever they found it, and all of these mystery religions were driven underground and forgotten. And it has to do, you know, there are other factors, such as the botanical scarcity of decent hallucinogens in the European uh, ecosystem, but, you know, details which we can talk about. But the point is, 2,000 years is all that we've been away from this. And in that 2,000 years, you know, we've elaborated the most lethal set of assumptions and cultural conventions ever brought forth. I mean, you know, war before, people used to knock each other on the head, but in the hands of these unstoned uh, dominator types with this linear linguistic bias, which then is totally reinforced by the printing press, well, you see, you know, it's a suicidal cultural style. Well, one of the things that I think uh, happened in the 60s that supports my case, in the wake of LSD, you see a tremendous enriching of language, endlessly sneered at by those who don't talk that way. But, uh, you know, it introduced the notion of the vibe, the ego trip. Um, these are worthwhile concepts. Uh, the bummer, uh, the flashback. Uh, these are linguistic pearls that, uh, you know, crystallized out of that experience. See, I believe that the psychedelics are working at the cultural level to promote language but also to, it's, it's not simply a linear enriching of language, there's also something going on biologically that language is actually gaining in the vertical dimension in its uh, uh, beholdability. And uh, this is taken very seriously in the Amazon because these small hunter-gatherer groups where there's big pressure on protein and there's no room for mistakes, they guide their societies by taking these drugs together in a group situation and collectively they see, whatever this means, they see and they model uh, what their future is going to be. It's true telepathy. You see, when you listen to my voice, if you understand what I'm saying, it's because my incoming words cause you to go to your dictionary and look them up <coughs> one by one, and if your dictionary is pretty close to my dictionary, we will understand each other. But the whole act of communication depends on this assumption that the dictionaries are the same. If they're not the same, then you will not understand me. If, on the other hand, I could make you see what I mean, this is not a culturally conditioned avenue of information transfer. You don't have to learn English to look at an English woman. 
It's easy. You just do it. It's at the biological level. And so this is, I think, in terms of consciousness expansion, you say, well, it's good it's as a general notion, but what direction is it moving? It's moving in the direction of literally a clarifying of language, a clarifying of language into something that can be beheld. And uh, it's an arrow toward... Uh, a greater domain of existential validity that each of us can uh, can move in. We need to communicate. We need to find out who we are, each of us individually, and then we need to tell each other. The whole dominator style of unstoned culture engineering is ego. That's what happens when you don't take psychedelic drugs as a culture ego flows in. That's what was happening on the plains of Africa. Every Saturday night, everybody was getting loaded and boundaries were dissolving. The boundary of the assumption of the uniqueness of the individual. They were taking these things and they were having, well, group sex, basically. These were the two things. It's clear because of the quality of psilocybin that it actually at, at mid-range doses causes arousal. You see, at very low doses, it increases visual acuity. Therefore, your hunting improves. Therefore, you and your progeny are more successful. And then at slightly higher doses, everybody's horny, and there's a lot of activity in the group and, and partying. At higher doses, then that turns into religion, and you're just slammed to the floor of the cave. You know. So it's this three-step thing which plays on our basic needs to drive us into a deeper and deeper relationship with this, uh, with this mystery. And it's such, a, it's such a huge idea that this is what we are, that this is so fundamental, that this isn't just some curiosity of, you know, hedonic West Coast, uh, so forth and so on, but that it is in fact central to understanding and defining humanness and to trying to grab some of the controls of this sinking submarine of a planet and get it back up to the surface long enough for us to all uh, climb in a rowboat and to make our way somewhere. So thank you for being here today, all of you. Thank you.